Okay, I think we'll get started uh, because we have to end right on time. Uh, they're going to use this space for a recruitment event immediately after this. So we have to we have to conclude on time. So, welcome everyone. My name is Scott Knowles. I'm the chair of the history department here at Drexel. I've been at Drexel since 2000, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first installation of our Drexel history lecture series. So, you may be wondering what this is all about. I'll give you just a little background, but before I do, I kind of want to find out um, who's in the room. So how many of you are students registered for the course? Okay, that's a good number. And then faculty and deans <laughs> and provosts, okay. And then uh, administrative staff, <laughs> some, okay. Alumni, okay, yeah. Um, People interested in Drexel history who were walking by the building and found their way in. We do have one. Excellent. Okay, outstanding. So um, this is a series that will happen, uh, certainly for the next few months, it'll happen um, always at this day and time. So if you're looking for something to do on Thursdays at noon, we're going to be having this session uh, for the rest of the fall term, and we hope that we'll continue it throughout the year. The idea came from a project that we started two years ago to tell the history of Drexel University uh, in one book. And there have been multiple histories of Drexel, but never told in one comprehensive volume. And President Fry sort of challenged us to take on this project, and we did. We started with the idea that it would have 12 chapters and 12 authors. It ended up with 25 chapters and 34 authors. And as one of the co-editors, I can tell you that was uh, quite an experience, and some of the authors are here in the in the room, and the fact that they were willing to come to this indicates I think we kept morale pretty high throughout that process. Uh, it was really a phenomenal effort of all of the authors, and we had students, uh, we had 10 history students serving as research assistants, two history students serving as co-ops throughout it, research co-ops, so it was really uh, heavy reliance on university communications, on the archives, on the different archives across the Drexel ecosystem. Um, many, many people around Drexel pitched in. So that was, um, the book will be appearing in November. Uh, it will be out. Um, the students in the course have an advanced copy of the book, and hopefully you've received that. If you didn't receive the syllabus or the reading, please let me know after class, and I'll make sure you have those, those materials. Briefly, I, just wanna, I do want to acknowledge and thank President Fry for his uh, vision to undertake this project. He's quite a fan of university institutional histories, as it turns out. And, but also many, many other people, university communications, and I, uh, including Lori Doyle and her very dedicated staff, uh, the folks from IRT who are here webcasting and archiving this event for us, as well as the Alumni Association, which helped to fund the entire endeavor, and Tony Noche and Ira Taffer, um, and then institutional advancement, which also helped. So it's been at many different levels throughout Drexel, people have expressed what I had hoped to find when I started out with this, is that people do have a lot of interest in Drexel's history and in telling that story. So this series will do that. Every week you're going to hear from a different author of the book. I'm going to start out this week just by giving us a sort of general overview of the book and an overview of Drexel's history. And that's why I gave it this impossible title, How Do You... This is a question I asked myself, really it became the title. How do you tell 125 years of Drexel history? You could just read the 450 pages, which I hope you will. Um, but I'll give you an overview of what I think some of the high points are today. And as a historian, I'm interested not only in continuity, so what are the things um, that stretch across time um, from the early days of Drexel, and some of those are artifacts that we have and paintings around the, the walls which indicate to us some continuity to the Drexel family going back to the 19th century, or the building itself or the room that we're meeting in. But I'm also interested in change. And that's what a lot of history is trying to do, is to help us understand the continuities through across time, but also when change occurs, why? What's the context of change? And Drexel University today is quite a different place from the Drexel Institute of 1891, the Drexel Institute of Art, Science, and Industry. So how do we get from here to there? Uh, and what are the key turning points? That's what I'm going to focus my attention on today. So thank you all for being here, and we'll dive into it now. I'm going to start by talking about the founding of the institution and the context for it. Anthony Drexel, uh, which you may know a bit about him, 
his father was an Austrian immigrant who came, um, like so many in the 19th century, had an almost classic immigrant story, arrived from Europe. He had to leave his home in Austria to escape Napoleon's army or to escape being pushed into Napoleon's army. Um, he had art training uh, early in his life, and he came to Philadelphia to maybe not to make his fortune. I think that's probably revisionist, but to at least survive and try to thrive um, in this very dynamic urban environment of Philadelphia um, of the early, uh, before the Civil War in the 19th century. And he found some success. He, did, he found some success as an itinerant portrait painter um, in Latin America, but he found even more success um, as a currency speculator uh, and set up the Drexel Bank here in Philadelphia down on 3rd Street. You may not know when you go to Old City and you walk on 3rd Street between Market uh, and Walnut Street, because now it's so full of bars and restaurants, but that was, if you were here in, uh, in Philadelphia in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, that was the center of American finance. Wall Street, things were happening in Wall Street, but it was not clear yet that Wall Street even would be dominant over Philadelphia as, as a center of commercial development, as a center of banking. Um, and so the, the Drexel Bank became, by the time of the Civil War, the most prominent uh, investment bank in America. Um, as was not uncommon in those days and all the way up into the 20th century, the federal treasury had to sometimes borrow money or ask for fed, uh, financial assistance from private institutions, and the Drexel Bank was one of those. The Drexel Bank also was extremely important in uh, just in giving its name and giving the confidence to investors during um, the period of the Civil War when the federal government was selling bonds. Um, to raise money to keep troops in the field. And so the Drexel Bank played these important roles after the Civil War as the country was building a transcontinental railroad network. The Drexel Bank, again, was deeply, deeply involved in the development of a railroad economy, which in a sense was the first um, national industry that we had in America, literally stretching from coast to coast, even sort of creating the idea of the transcontinental economy in the 19th century. So there was probably no um, economic initiative in America and making America in the 19th century that uh, the Drexel Bank didn't have its hand on. And Anthony Drexel, um, of his three brothers, was the one, um, he was the quietest, but he was the one who also inspired the greatest confidence in his father to um, take leadership in the bank. If you believe the stories that were written about him, um, he went in early to the bank, even as a child. He sometimes slept there. He took his meals there. He seemed to have been most comfortable um, in the bank and pouring over the records and pouring over the financial news and trying to understand what kinds of investments, what kinds of securities, and what kind of confidence um, he could have in the different opportunities that were around there. He didn't write much about his own life, and unfortunately, most of his letters um, have been lost. Uh, next week, we will have Cordelia Biddle, uh, descendant in the Drexel family who will be giving a talk more specifically about the family. So if you're interested in, that, in the Drexel family, please do come back next week at noon. When he died, um, there was a burst, there were sort of two bursts actually of media attention about Anthony J. Drexel. Um, one was when the Institute opened uh, in 1891, 92, and then uh, just a year later when he died. And when he died, actually, he was an intensely private person. Um, he had famous and wealthy friends. Um, he was a mentor to J.P. Morgan. He was friends uh, with Ulysses S. Grant. But you probably wouldn't have known it if you went looking for him in the society pages. He kept a low profile. Um, but when he was dead, many people who had worked with him or had respect for him, there was this sort of outpouring about A.J. Drexel. So a lot of what we know about him comes from newspaper articles and features written just at that at that moment, and he made the cover of Harper's Weekly when the Institute was opened, and this is a photograph from the opening uh, of the Institute. When the Institute opened uh, in December the 17th, 1891, in its inauguration, uh, Anthony J. Drexel didn't attend. It was sort of a classic move for a guy who really didn't like the, the limelight. Uh, the answer he gave is that he was in mourning because his wife had recently died. Um, but if you look at the, the list of people who attended, it was really a who's who of American politics of the time. Um, if you go to the Drexel Archives website, you can actually pull out of it, and I'm happy to send to anybody who's interested, the inaugural program of Drexel University from December of 1891, sorry, Drexel Institute from 1891. Um, and Thomas Edison was here, J.P. Morgan was here, heads of the church, heads of all of the regional universities and universities all the way up into New England. 
Um, several members of the federal government and local state government were here. So clearly the outpouring um, at that time was based on an idea, not only in a sort of confidence in Drexel and a faith that any institution he would found would have something strong behind it and that it was rooted in a good idea. Um, but also I think, you know, there's this, truly was a sense of the Drexel Institute being, um, it was a novelty for Philadelphians because we didn't have anything quite like this at the time. But it was not necessarily a novelty nationally. The founding of the Drexel Institute and the model of the institute was similar to other higher education institutions of its time, ones that we know a lot more about now, um, but you may have heard of the Armour Institute. If you haven't, you've heard of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, if you've never heard of Carnegie Tech, you've probably heard of Carnegie Mellon University, um, Stevens Institute in Hoboken, um, Case Institute, which is now Case Western Reserve. These are all technical institutes and Drexel among them that were founded in the 1880s and 1890s for a very specific reason in a very specific context. And I'll say a little bit more about that. This image is a picture uh, promotional card created by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which when it went bankrupt in 1970 was the largest corporation in America. Imagine that. It wasn't that long ago that the largest corporation in America uh, was a railroad. Um, much of their wealth was tied up in other kinds of holdings by that point. But this is an image looking west from you know, somewhere uh, above the Schuylkill River. And what you're looking at here is railroad traffic and a railroad station, but also stockyards. And if you're familiar, as you just exit 30th Street Station, if you're walking west on Market Street, that first building on your left there is actually the old stockyards, part of the old stockyards building, a slaughterhouse. It was the largest slaughterhouse on the East Coast. If you were to walk uh, from what's now 30th Street Station to Drexel today, you would have walked past the largest railroad, rail yard in the East Coast, the largest slaughterhouse on the East Coast, the largest um, industrial porcelain factory on the East Coast, the largest rail car manufacturing plant on the East Coast. And we were in the center. When we think of industry, I think a lot of times maybe Chicago was better than Philadelphia at doing this. When we imagine Chicago, we imagine Upton Sinclair and the stockyards. But we really should be imagining Drexel campus in a sense, because this space was right in the center of the most dense sort of urban um, industrial network in America at that time. And maybe only a few other places in the world would have been able to compete. And so what does that mean? And, and of course, if we, if we go to Cleveland and look at Case, or if we go to Chicago and look at Armour, same is true. These are institutes that are founded right in the center of the industrial mix right in the center of these industrial neighborhoods. They're not in the leafy preserves um, of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right? They are right in the center of the action. You may think, well, what in the world does that have to do with higher learning? It doesn't seem like a very good place to contemplate Shakespeare or Bach or Euclid. And yet, Anthony Drexel, like his peers, saw that there was a need in American society for a new form of education <laughs> And I would go a step beyond that and to say that they, he saw a need for a new form of social mobility. That higher education up to that point was really a preserve of elites. I mean, the traditional purpose of a university in Europe and in America throughout the 18th and 19th century had been to educate lawyers, physicians, and theologians. The occasional poet uh, would slip through there, uh, as the occasional artist would slip through there, but in general, it was very highly focused on those, and they taught the traditional, ancient liberal arts. The curriculum was highly bound to an idea that you learned to be, to be literate, you learned Greek and Latin, and then if you wanted to be super modern and cutting edge, you might read, you would read Shakespeare, and that's about as far forward in time as you would come. But of course, you know, that model of what higher education is and who it's for seems a little bit out of step with the realities of the industrial economy that's developing in places like Philadelphia, Chicago, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and so on. And so what Drexel saw was an opportunity 
to create a new kind of institution rooted in the economic realities of the time and the place. And I think, importantly, not to dismiss this place as just a place of work, and that the lessons of this place are just the lessons that are learned by the people who work there, but that there's nothing further to be extracted from this, that we can't make this into higher education. This is just a space of work. Drexel saw that, that maybe that was a limited idea. I think there's something else we have to take into account here, which is that at this moment, there's a great deal of anxiety in America over the status of women in society, over the status of African Americans in society, over the status of immigrants in society. The first move towards, large scale move towards unionization in America and the labor movement begins in the 1870s. It's picking up speed by the 1880s and 1890s. By that time, laborers had organized enough that they could actually create general strikes and shut down in various places across the country in coal mines or in railroads, they could shut down the economy for usually just a day or two at a time, but the strike in the Homestead Mill in 1991, when Drexel was founded in 1892, that's in Pittsburgh, demonstrated that these strikes could also lead to a backlash of violence. If the authorities had to come in, and you might find yourself in a situation where you had the state and the owners now in pitched battle against the workers. And if you're familiar at all with your 19th century history, you know that people are imagining what had happened in Europe in 1871 and what's to be found in the pages of Karl Marx. And this idea that there's some sort of inevitability to class conflict which can lead to a destabilization in society that could cause a rupture in society. So I think these two things are happening simultaneously. One is there's an opportunity here because the economy of America is being utterly transformed by manufacturing, transportation, and revolutions in power, electricity. At the same time, particularly among the elite classes, the owners, the bankers, the politicians, there was a real fear that the means of creating this wealth, that is, the mass importation of immigrants with their labor power, bringing them into society but not having some sort of means for them to move through society in a way that mobilized their talent, in a way that brought them up a rung or two in the social pecking order, that if they had created society without mobility, that even in America, where it had maybe been thought impossible, that by the 1890s it seemed possible you could actually have class-based revolution. So I think those two impulses are very lively when we're looking at the, the moment of the founding of the Institute, and I think it also helps us understand why A.J. Drexel, when he did look in the 1880s at founding a women's college out in Wayne. I mean, you can imagine how all of our commutes would be quite different and our lives would be different if Drexel the University today was in, in Wayne. Um, but he, he decided not to go that route. He did decide to keep the idea of a university or an institute early on that had its doors open to women, that actively recruited women, um, that actively was non-sectarian, so it did not privilege one religious domination over another, and that it was specifically focused on facilitating for the working class um, the means of getting, even just through informal lectures or through more formal channels of education, um, some skills development which would then enable them to move up the ladder in their professions. And the thing, I guess the last piece of context I would throw in here, which becomes more relevant even after Drexel has died. I mean, he founds, he, he comes up with the idea, he endows the university, it's founded, this fantastic building is, is created, and then he dies. And it's left to the first president, James McAllister, and the presidents who would follow him, like Hollis Godfrey, in this sort of early generation, to determine the trajectory and what's happening also at exactly that moment is the emergence of the American engineering profession. If you said, I'm an engineer in America in 1860, people would not ask to see your degree. You could be an engineer, you could self-describe as an engineer, basically as a person who was pretty handy and with a very strong knowledge in what they called techniques at that time. Right? That means you made boilers, you serviced boilers, you worked on um, locomotives. You knew your way around a blast furnace, maybe. But it didn't mean you had to have a degree in engineering. In fact, if you wanted to get an engineering degree at the time of the Civil War, it was pretty hard to do. Um, at that time, I think only two places offered it, West Point and Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. 
But from the 1870s forward up until the time that Drexel is founded, we see this really strong growth in engineering as a, as a profession, something that you went to get a degree in. And it, the numbers of engineers, degreed engineers in America, goes up dramatically in the first 10 years of the 20th century. So the early history, I'll just... Um, just read to you the different departments. When the Institute was founded in 1891, and the first president, James McAllister, who'd been the uh, school superintendent of Milwaukee and then the school superintendent of Philadelphia, uh, and had what you would call for the time uh, progressive ideas about education, hands-on education, what we now call experiential learning, um, was very much in the, in the wind in those days, sort of rooted in a John Dewey philosophy. If you're at all interested in the history of education, you may be familiar with that. And this is how they organized the institute. The art department, this I think is the art department <laughs> in the bottom left. Uh, the scientific department, the department of mechanic arts. And, and just to linger on that for a second, I mean even this term of a mechanic. Who is a mechanic? I mean, there's a lot of sort of slippage just at this moment. Do I need to be a, do I have to have a degree to be involved in things that are mechanical? This is in very much changing just in these years. The Department of Domestic Economy, pictured here on the bottom right. Uh, presumably this is a, an ironing class. The Technical Department, the Business Department, the Department of Physical Training, the Normal Department for the Training of Teachers. So that's an old, maybe an old fashioned term you may have heard of, a normal school, an education school the Department of Lectures and Evening Classes, right, which would become the Goodwin College eventually, and the Library and Reading Room and the Museum. And just to linger on that for a second, um, as you walked into this building in 1891, in 1892, when it's just opening, you found yourself in the great central court and this is a building designed by the Wilson Brothers architects, if you're familiar at all with the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876. This may look a bit like some of the architecture there. It's a clearly sort of inspired, um, sort of neo, um, neoclassical building, but it also had sort of elements that almost felt like a train station. The Wilsons were pretty good at synthesizing more sort of contemporary transportation and industrial ideas with older architectural motifs. We're gonna do a walking tour in this series in just a few weeks, if you're interested in such things, if you learn better on your feet. Um, and so we'll, we'll actually walk around main building a little bit and then look at some of the other buildings just close by. So as you walked in, um, I may have this wrong, but I think the library was on your left and the museum was on your right. And so that was, you really learn a lot about a building and an institution for what purposes they put right up front. You came off the street the loud, noisy street with the factories across the way and the, the lowing of cattle two blocks away. Industry is sort of humming around you and you walk into this refined space and all of a sudden you've got a world-class museum on one side and a library on the other. I think it's really interesting, again, the sort of synthesis that Drexel was aiming for. We want the structure itself, we want the institution close to a train station so people can commute to the institute. We want them to be able to walk from their job or to walk from the working class neighborhoods just to the north of here, like Mantua and Palatin Village. But when they come in, they find a space of refinement where the architecture lifts you up, where the books educate you, and where the museum shows you something about a world that you can't travel to. Okay, so pretty quickly, um, the Institute reinvents itself. And I use this term reinvention because it seems kind of Drexel-y. Uh, we're always inventing and innovating here. And there was a, a reinvention that occurred pretty quickly. Uh, and if you look at the early curriculum, actually early on, they, they start changing it. Students maybe um, look at their, you look at your plan of study. We hand you the plan of study, sheet of paper, here's your plan of study. It looks like, you know, this is pretty, this is stable. Right? Here's a series of classes. What could possibly be going on behind the scenes here? Maybe it doesn't even occur. If you're on the other side, on the faculty or the staff side, you know that what we teach in the university is a constant source of revision, introspection, sometimes argument, 
always collegial. Um, but that there's always this debate about what exactly should we be teaching and how do we teach it. And if you want to find a lot of that sort of uh, rapid motion around what the curriculum should look like, all you have to do is look in these first few years at, at Drexel. In 1894, in 1892, I should say, just after it's opened, a, a library school is founded. In 1894, they opened a Department of Domestic Science. And in 1900, they begin to offer electrical engineering. And as I said before, engineering is just emerging at this time as um, a new specialization. And if you look, and, and again, to some of these other institutes I mentioned, like Armour and like Case, electrical engineering was the cutting edge type of engineering at the time, because what's happening? Right? The electric light bulb had first been demonstrated in 1881 at the foot of Wall Street. Thomas Edison, who was pretty smart about such things, went to businesses and said, I'll give you electricity and light bulbs for free if you'll promise to turn on your lights at dusk. All right? People start to get, and you go to department stores and say, I'll give you electricity for free, but you've got to put it right on the street level behind big glass window. So there's this sense of selling electricity, and it worked. Every American city and every American industry is electrifying at this time, and Drexel got, on, got in on it very early. Uh, these are students in a motor machine shop a little bit later in 1916. This gives a sense of what the Mechanic Arts Department Electrical Laboratory would have looked like. And if you can see it, it may be a little hard to make out, but I wonder if the students, how you would feel about, um, here they have the coveralls on, but notice underneath the coveralls, they're all wearing ties. Right? What if you got your, your syllabus and on it it had a dress code, too, that said, and also, please be sure to show up uh, in a coat and tie for this educational environment. Um, and so they're kind of dressed up for their work, but they've got their hands dirty, and they're learning by doing, by taking apart these machines, some of which were machines that actually had been purchased or loaned from the Franklin Institute or leftovers from the Centennial Exposition. And that was actually a pretty common thing to do at this time. We get uh, an important change when Hollis Godfrey comes in as the second president. He starts in 1913. And this is when the real reinvention into the Technical Institute takes shape. So in these early years, Drexel Institute has a lot of free events that are going on here. It's a pretty informal place in very many ways. It's not centrally focused on what it says art, science, and industry are the sort of leading concepts, but it's not focused on any particular curriculum. Godfrey uh, was an engineer who was uh, a tailor. He, he was a, a, a student of uh, Frederick W. Taylor. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Taylor or Taylorism. Do you know what Taylorism is? Absolutely. That's exactly right. And in fact, that Taylor, who was an engineer who worked at the Midvale Steel Factory, which was not far from here, um, he was hired um, not because of his technical acumen, but because of his understanding of the way labor processes worked. And he was sort of famous for coming in with a clipboard and a stopwatch. And he would just tell workers, do your task. Pretend like I'm not here. And he would time how long it took him to do one one task, and then he would write this up in a report and take it to the management of whatever firm it was that had hired him and said, yeah, you can streamline this in the following 50 ways. He was uh, hated um, by some in the labor movement who thought that his sole purpose was to actually decrease the amount of labor necess necessary in a factory. Um, he was an early proponent of automation, you know, that we could replace certain um, pieces of human labor in the manufacturing system with um, automation. But in the emerging discipline of engineering, disciplines of engineering, he was a hero. And he was hired by the city of Philadelphia actually to make an assessment of the quality of the street lighting of the city. And based on the success of that study um, and some fame that he won around that, he was hired at Drexel. World War I broke out um, in the midst of sort of early years of his presidency, and he was called into war service, and he was instrumental in um, the development, uh, really first development in modern times of an American sort of war economy and the idea of managing the war economy, trying to make sense of what the different industries were capable of doing and how they should be managed. And we get from the historical record the idea 
that Godfrey, in those years, developed a really strong philosophy that technical institutes, of which Drexel was becoming one, um, technical institutes had a, a strong place in society during wartime in serving the national government, serving the federal government, serving the war effort, but that that could go beyond that. That there should be a tighter fit a sort of um, uh, between government and industry and between education, government, and industry. And he had this sort of notion that there needed to be um, some organization around this. That we shouldn't just allow the economy to develop willy-nilly. That we should actually focus on the educational side and ask employers what is it that you want the students to learn? Uh, instead of being the other way around, where that the institute would decide what the students should learn and then hope that they do well in industry, he wanted to have a fit between those two. In 1914, his second year as president, Drexel founded an engineering school, freestanding. And in 1919, just at the end of World War I, uh, they created the uh, four-year engineering co-op program. And that was, I think, in many ways, a sort of turning point for Drexel we can say that's truly reinvented itself as a technical institute. Um, and it continued to elaborate its course offerings and its programs in engineering until um, all the way through in the 1920s and through the 1930s, even in the midst of the Great Depression in 1936, uh, Drexel changed its name to the Drexel Institute of Technology, uh, and it became an accredited engineering institute at that time. And so we see this evolution from sort of institute interested in art science industry and with this broad public mission that on the eve of World War II, Drexel had evolved into a pretty finely tuned instrument of creating technical workers who could then, throughout their, their learning process, they would go into industry and learn and bring what they learned back here and that there would be this relationship between what they learn on the factory floor, what they learn um, in, in management, and then what they're learning in the classroom. So that leads pretty easily into a, a second reinvention. The second reinvention into the post-war powerhouse in some ways maybe has less to do with uh, Drexel um, leading or shaping the city, but maybe more to do with its being shaped by what's happening in the city. And there's this constant, again, relationship back and forth between Philadelphia and Drexel. Through World War II and after World War II, the federal government learning, I mean, just to sort of distill it down, what are the lessons that the, the War Department and the federal government learned from World War II? They'd begun to learn these lessons in World War I, but World War II solidified it that somehow we put scientists and engineers together in a remote location in New Mexico and we won the war. Somehow universities, you know, we, we thought it was the War Department and the various war labs and the various camps and places where... Um, uh, generals study tactics in West Point, in the Army War College in Annapolis where we learn how to win. And that might have been true, but what they also learned was that physics and chemistry and electrical engineering and computers were also tools of victory. And in fact, if you looked at the Manhattan Project after the war, which they did, they said, yeah, this was a big investment, um, but they drew the conclusion that this was how we won. It was our investments in science and technology. Some of these were investments that were made really without any purpose in the 1920s and 30s, without any specific purpose. And then when World War II happened, they realized it's good that we actually had chemists and engineers working in war service. And so Drexel, of course, was one of the many universities between Drexel and Penn. I haven't ever counted, but I'm quite sure that there was a great deal of research money that flowed in here during World War II. Um, one statistic says that one out of every six dollars spent by the federal treasury in World War II was actually spent in Philadelphia, which is pretty remarkable if you think about it. And war has always been good for Philadelphia, not to sound cynical, but the Civil War, World War I, and World War II each ballooned the economy of the city and of the region. And it was really through and after World War II that you know, Philadelphia took on this moniker of the, what was called the arsenal of democracy, that this is where the ships and the guns and the bullets, and the helmets, and the uniforms. Every uniform worn by uniformed service personnel in World War II was made in Philadelphia. A lot of the medicines that were used in the hospitals were made here in Philadelphia. A great many of the doctors who were trained, who went into war service, were trained in Philadelphia. It is a place 
that made the techniques, it made the knowledge, and it made the material of war. And that lesson that's learned through the war is that we need strong technical institutes to facilitate it. And Drexel is right there. So under you know, James Creese, who becomes the president in 1945, Drexel really puts even greater emphasis on this idea as a, a, a preparatory ground for people who are going to go directly into engineering and that the co-op is um, actually an instrument that allows them to pay for their education while they're in school. And in those days, the tuition was kept down such that it was basically possible um, for uh, an engineering student to come, and do one, two, three co-ops, uh, and then earn enough money on their co-op to, to pay for their tuition. I was, in a couple of interviews we did for students who were here in the 50s and 60s, they told us that when they graduated, like with an electrical engineering degree, uh, that, and they had, they had uh, student mailboxes at that time in this building. Imagine that, you go check your student mailbox, physical mailbox. And that in the spring when they were graduating, there'd be letters there from Westinghouse saying, you know, from other manufacturers in the region, basically offering them a job. We understand you're an electrical engineering graduate from Drexel University, come on down. Um, that shows a pretty tight fit between the university and the local regional economy. This image here on the right shows us Crease uh, demonstrating the growth plans for the institute in the 1950s, the greater Drexel, the development of an urban university. And the other thing that's happening at this time, so we have enormous federal investments in science and technology education. We have enormous regional demand for these kind of graduates. And they start, you know, the student population is growing, and so they start realizing we're outgrowing the old campus. The old main building is not going to cut it anymore. They only had a couple of other buildings at that time. It was completely a commuter campus. Uh, so they had to build a women's dormitory early on after World War II, but there still wasn't any housing for men. Men lived in rooming houses all around Drexel University, all the way over towards Penn's campus, or they lived in fraternity houses. It's actually one of the interesting features, the history of Greek life at Drexel has a lot to do with providing housing for students. I heard a great story of an engineering graduate named Regis Cubitt who showed up here one day in the early 60s, as I guess you could do in those days, and showed up and said, I'm here to attend Drexel University. And they said, oh, okay. Please fill out these papers. I see the enrollment management people here. Who's here from enrollment management? Anybody? Can you imagine a time when the students just turn up? Yeah, we're ready. Um, and they said, fine, fine, uh, good. And he said, well, where do I live? I said, no, we don't know. Well, you could try over here, some rooming houses. Try the Greek row. And so he literally walked up and went door to door knocking at fraternity houses until he found one that said, yeah, we've got a room. We let freshmen live here. We hope you'll pledge. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll wash out. Some people do. Good luck. And that was how he started his time at Drexel. That's how informal it was, but also how much confidence people had in the model, in the educational model. Nevertheless, Drexel was growing beyond uh, bursting at the seams by the 50s and into the 60s, and so it had this, um, these pretty uh, great plans for growth, if you can tell on the right side. So the old campus basically ends um, at the armory building. So I, you probably can't make it out. This is sort of the old parameters of the campus up to the 50s, and then all of that new construction, everything that's numbered up there in the top left, that's where the university was growing into the 1960s. Well, that <laughs> this reinvention as a post-war powerhouse also came with some growing pains. And it was the first period in which you actually see some um, tense relations developing between Drexel and the neighborhoods surrounding it. As it moved, as Drexel started to talk about building buildings in the Palatin Village neighborhood, residents of the neighborhood actually formed, uh, there were six civic associations in the neighborhood and they melded into one, the East Palatin Concerned Residents. Uh, and they sought to first just to ask questions, um, which were not usually very welcome questions, and eventually by the late 1960s um, to slow down or even stop Drexel's development into these neighborhoods. What had begun to happen in these years, and the, the next to last lecture, if this is interesting to you, the next, next to last lecture in the series will talk only about this process, is that this industrial economy that had been going with such power 
just after World War II, in Philadelphia, it was beginning to recede by the 1960s. Manufacturers were beginning to look to other places in America or outside of America to manufacture. And it was pretty obvious even by the mid-60s, there's still plenty of manufacturing jobs, but it's pretty obvious even by the mid-60s that they're beginning to taper off. And so that had an impact on the neighborhoods around Drexel. They began to decline slowly. The other thing that was happening is that the city of Philadelphia, like many cities in America, was going through what we called an urban renewal moment. Uh, city planners in Philadelphia, like Edmund Bacon, had, were granted tremendous powers by the federal government in the 1950s and 60s to come in and basically, um, like urban masters, look at the, at the property values of the city on a map and say, this is an under, underperforming area, this is an underperforming area. Quite often, the underperforming areas were labeled slums. They were predominantly immigrant or African-American neighborhoods. The people in those neighborhoods lacked the political power to push back against the urban renewal process. And if their neighborhood was declared a slum, as happened to part of the Mantua neighborhood at that time, they were basically powerless. And the city could exercise what's called imminent domain power. They could literally exercise the, the right of state takings. The concept of takings is a simple one. Eminent domain means that the city will take something which will inconvenience some people for the benefit of all. That's the central philosophy of eminent domain and urban renewal. But when it was practiced in such a racialized form as it was in the 1950s and 60s, it was hard for people to look at that and say, we don't see that this is benefiting all. Institutions that wanted to grow in the 50s and 60s, like Drexel, were great, um, they were the great beneficiaries of eminent domain. But it didn't come without pushback. And in fact, African American neighborhoods, and not only African American neighborhoods, uh, Palatin Village was predominantly a white middle class neighborhood with some working class as well. They organized and began to say, you know, this eminent domain isn't working out for us. And we had in 1970 and 71 ongoing tense standoff between people in the neighborhood and Drexel. People going, showing up at construction sites and um, literally standing at the fences and protesting or sabotaging, tearing down fences overnight. It was an ongoing process to the point at which the president then, uh, Haggerty, had to meet with them. In the, and this is from the triangle. So this is also during the Vietnam War. The students who were the editor and the students who were writing for the Triangle felt that they actually, they started publishing the title of the newspaper upside down to show what chaos there was going on in the campus at just that moment. Um, and that image is an image of President Haggerty meeting with students who had made common cause with residents of the neighborhood to sit in in the main building right here to protest the expansion of Drexel. It may be hard to wrap your mind around the idea that a, a civic unrest could occur in the main building, but in 1971 it did. It ultimately was resolved um, when a federal judge told Drexel it couldn't expand any further. And that held in place for almost 10 years. Drexel didn't expand further into the neighborhoods until the 1980s. Okay, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna have to move quickly. And historians can never resist giving you an impossibly text-ridden slide. I've been very restrained up to now, so I let it all out on one slide. Um, because of this deindustrialization process that was happening, um, Drexel was right on the verge of needing another reinvention by the mid-1990s. The cost of education had gone up, regional demand for technical labor had gone down. Um, deindustrialization was taking a toll at Drexel, and in the midst of the crisis, Chuck Pannoni, who was a graduate of Drexel, was brought in as the interim president in 1994. And he tells a tremendous story in which he was charged basically by the board to begin looking at options for Penn taking over Drexel, Temple taking over Drexel. And when Chuck tells a story, there's a sort of glimmer in his eye. And he, he says, I didn't do any of that. I just stuck to what was happening at Drexel. And he, he really just looked at it as a series of management problems and communication problems. The campus, the quality of the buildings, um, the standards for incoming students had been allowed to go down pretty steadily uh, in the early 1990s. And 
Pannoni brought uh, an attitude of good management and again, just sort of trying to get down to the fundamentals of what Drexel could do. And I think he and certainly his, um, the president who followed him, Constantine Papadakis in the center there in the image of the medical school, uh, they were instrumental in this third reinvention which basically they had to realize that the industrial economy of Philadelphia was changing, receding, maybe not completely going away. But if that economy was going to change and if the federal government was no longer going to park enormous amounts of money in science and technology in the Technical Institute, maybe the university had to change too. And in the intervening years, Drexel had again changed its name from Drexel Institute. It changed it in 1970 to Drexel University. But it hadn't really fully become a university by the mid-1990s and the way we think of universities with medical schools and law schools and a completely diversified portfolio of arts, humanities, and sciences. That was still a project waiting to be done. When Papadakis came in, he found enormous faculty talent and research. He found a high reputation in the institution, of course, in its traditional disciplines, business, libraries, computing, sciences, and engineering. Um, but he also found the need to create, begin the process of creating what we now look at as a post-industrial university, a university that could meet the needs of a regional economy that was by the 90s shifting over into medicine, medical education, medical research, nursing, services, high tech. If we looked at the top 10 industries in America and in Philadelphia in 1945, they would all be manufacturing based the top employers, maybe the city and maybe the archdiocese would be the only two that weren't involved in industry or banking. Uh, as we get into the turn of the new century, the top 10 employers are going to be the University of Pennsylvania Medical System, the Temple Medical System, various universities, uh, insurance companies, Merck. Right? These are going to be some of the top employers in the region by this point. And so in 2002, after a, a lengthy process, um, of consolidation and many twists and turns, which we'll hear about later um, when one of our guest speakers, Stephen Peitzman, will talk to us about the medical school. Um, Drexel, in 2002, uh, creates the Drexel University College of Medicine, and that's accompanied by the creation of a college of nursing and health professions and a public health school as well. So these are some of the factors of a post-industrial university. Two other things that Papadakis did importantly, um, he put a great deal of emphasis on the creation of um, uh, the creation of, a, of a, a pathway from the co-op to graduate training. Drexel had not always been too strong in the uh, movement of students into graduate training and then in online education. So those were two other key insights. An honors college was founded at this time as well. At first as a tool to try to uh, not give up on attracting the best and brightest of the region, but then also as a sort of laboratory for interdisciplinary explorations as well. And so that reinvention, I'm coming to a close here, that reinvention uh, continues, some might say we're still in the middle of it, uh, following the creation of the College of Medicine and the founding of a, of a law school in 2007. Papadakis uh, becomes ill in 2009 and he dies. And, and I remember and many others might remember that he was the kind of person that when I you heard he was ill, you didn't actually believe it was possible for him to die. The university had gone through such a dramatic and dynamic period in this sort of reinvention of itself in a much shorter time frame than the previous reinventions. And yet, um, the vision for the future of the university um, had to be remade again, or at least changed again, when the new president, John Fry, our current president, came in in 2010. And I think I'll leave you with with this, because I do believe we're in the middle of this one now. And so historians are not allowed to talk about the present, so I guess I'll have to drop you off here. We're certainly not supposed to talk about the future. <laughs> but so maybe I'll just leave that there for your delectation, uh, Schuylkill Yards development. John Fry has uh, a pretty coherent vision for what this next reinvention is going to look like. It's a global, globalized institution, that is, Drexel has a network of research partners and industry partners around the world. We draw students from around the world and we send students to other places in the world, but we do that without losing sight of the needs of Drexel, the need of Drexel to pay attention to its um, identity as a civic partner with its neighboring, uh, with its neighbors. 
That, I would say, in many ways, is an artifact of the decline um, of government in Philadelphia, the decline of the capacity of Philadelphia's government from the 1970s all the way, we might argue, to the present, that what we call anchor institutions, like universities, have to step up and actually show leadership in areas that previously would have been left to city government. And I think that's something that John Fry understands very well, is that this is a moment of necessity, but also opportunity, um, and a moment to show good citizenship for the institution. And this is the question that he asked uh, in his first address um, to the university at a convocation. He put it back to the beginning. If Anthony Drexel were to walk today from main building in the institute through the campus and into the neighborhoods, would he be satisfied that we're fulfilling our mission as an urban university? Is Drexel University a good neighbor to the surrounding communities of Palton, Village, and Mantua? One might say, is that the kind of question a college president should even be asking? What, what's happened over time that this is actually the new purview of the institution? What does it mean for the university to become engaged in writing grants so that the neighborhoods to its north can become uh, the beneficiaries of a federal promise grant? It's not something that Drexel had ever engaged in before. And what will be the long-term implications of Drexel actually seeing not a small growth of its campus, but a much larger growth of its campus footprint, all the way to the school kill, all the way into a space where it will replace, I'm just going to go back here, this is where we started, this is the Drexel of the founding, 1891, this is the economy of that time, looking ahead 25 years, that picture becomes this. Okay, I hope that something in this last hour has grabbed your attention enough to keep you coming back next time. Um, thank you so much for attending, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Hi. Really enjoyed the presentation.